My name is Faith Dukes. I manage the K-12 uh, Berkeley Lab K-12 STEM education programs here at Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, we are located in Berkeley, California. We are a Department of Energy National Laboratory. Um, just below Lawrence Hall of Science, for those of you who might have been here for uh, some STEM education there at the hall, or um, we are also just above UC Berkeley, um, and they are a neighbor of ours as well as a many time and a, a lot of times they are also a collaborator. And so we will also hear from not only um, experts today from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, but also um, experts from Georgia Tech and from UC Berkeley around cybersecurity and privacy. So this is uh, our STEM Career Talks uh, panel that we will be doing. Uh, two weeks ago, you all joined us on October 23rd to talk about visualizing STEM and our scientists who use um, art in their science. And we posted that recording on our K-12 website. Today, we're talking about privacy and security. And in two more weeks, we'll be thinking outside the lab and talking with a geologist and other experts who use the lab outside of the traditional building and the traditional fence and go out into the world to find um, their experiments. So today, as I said, we are joined by experts in cybersecurity and privacy. Sean Pizer, Talia Parker, Tiffany Connors, and Serge Egelman are all going to join us to talk about their work and how would you, um, as an aspiring scientist or engineer, get into this kind of work? What skills do you need and what tools are they using um, in order to do this work? So, the way this uh, program will go is that we will have our speakers give a short introduction of themselves, a look at um, a bit of their career trajectory, as well as a look and an overview of the work that they do. Um, and then we'll get into our questions and answers um, for that group. So our first speaker today will be Serge Egelman, and I'll pull up his slide. And if you wanna join me on screen um, to share a little bit about your work and your career trajectory, um, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. You so um, I'm Sarah Jegelman. Um, I actually have uh, multiple jobs. Uh, so primarily, I direct the usable security and privacy research group at the International Computer Science Institute, which uh, similar to uh, the Berkeley Lab, uh, ICSI is a, a separate research institute that has a close affiliation with UC Berkeley. Um, I also have a, a presence in the computer science department at UC Berkeley. Um, relating to my research about two years ago, I also spun off a startup, uh, App Census, and so I'm co-founder and CTO of, of that as well on the side. So on the next slide, I can uh, talk a little bit about my career tra uh, trajectory and how I got to where I am. So uh, since I was a, a, a kid, I always wanted to be a scientist. Um, my dad's a scientist, but um, he's in biology. Um, but I guess it was my interest in computers that, that steered me towards uh, becoming a computer scientist. Um, and so in college, uh, I majored in computer engineering, um, and through that, I got interested in computer security, um, mostly uh, recreationally. It probably wasn't until my third year of college um, where I actually took a class. Um, but doing um, you know, security stuff, um, I also didn't really want to be a, a programmer. I didn't really like the idea of sitting you know, in front of a, a, a computer just writing code all day. Um, and so it was when I took a human computer interaction course, um, I was exposed to the idea that there are lots of other fields of computing and not just becoming a, a software developer. Um, so for instance, human computer action is the, the study of how humans interact with computers. So looking at how to design better interfaces, for instance, uh, how to improve the user experience, uh, but more importantly, studying how, you know, user interfaces might steer people wrong. And so uh, HCI is actually a very interdisciplinary field there. It, it takes a lot of uh, research methods from psychology, um, uh, economics, and, and so forth. 
Uh, and so it was, you know, towards the end of college when I was exposed to HCI and also still wanting to be a scientist, I decided to pursue a, a PhD because I wanted a research career. Um, and so through the interdisciplinary, I guess, HCI stuff that I, that I was getting interested in and also the focus on security, uh, my research steered towards uh, human factors in security. So looking specifically at how people make security mistakes um, and then how to improve systems and interfaces so that people make fewer security mistakes, um, such as you know choosing better passwords or making it more likely that people will obey warnings, uh, security warnings. Um, and so forth. Um, from that, I then got interested in privacy, which is very related to security, but um, slightly different. Um, and because of that, um, with privacy, privacy has a lot of policy implications. So there are a lot of people in law who work on privacy, for instance. Uh, and you know, through those interactions, uh, a lot of the, the policy implications of my research on privacy became clear. And so uh, now I'm still doing interdisciplinary work, but you know, uh, in addition to doing interdisciplinary work, uh, looking at human factors stuff, working with say psychologists and uh, behavioral economists, I'm now also doing uh, privacy policy work, collaborating with lawyers as well. Uh, so next slide, please. And I can show you some of the examples of current research. So most of the research that I do involves decision-making and privacy and security, such as looking at how people respond to warnings. Um, I've done a lot of research where, you know, we look at psychology literature to try and uh, inform us on how to design better warnings and then actually having people test these in the lab where we expose people to, um, you know, situations where they would you know, see a warning in real life. And then we can do controlled experiments where we manipulate the warnings to show, you know, different things and see which one resulted in people, you know, paying the most attention, for instance. Uh, I've done also a lot of research on how people uh, care about privacy. And so some of that is learning how to do surveys, which is very much a science. Um, as well as, uh, again, doing behavioral experiments where um, we have different manipulations and see whether people are you know, willing to go to different sites based on privacy policies and how to make that information uh, more prominent for them. Uh, and then there's also measurement experiments. So recently, my research group has been doing a lot on mobile apps, looking at what personal data mobile apps collect. And that's you know, you know, involving a lot of engineering, where we build infrastructure to automatically test apps so that we can then you know, do so, look at the data, um, and you know, draw conclusions about you know, what apps are doing with, with personal data. And so I, I guess that's, that's a broad overview. Um, I'm happy to go into details um, if people have questions, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thank you very much. And we will definitely get into the discussion of security versus privacy. I think that's a good question to have. Um, our next speaker will be Tiffany Connors, who is a cybersecurity engineer here at uh, Berkeley Lab. So Tiffany, if you want to do your introduction. Hi. Yeah, I'm uh, Tiffany Connors, and I work at, I'm a cybersecurity engineer at the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, which is uh, NERSC for short. Um, it's based at uh, Berkeley Lab, and um, at uh, our, we do scientific computing. So we have over 8,000 scientists around the world who use our, um, some of the fastest computers in the world to do um, they're uh, science experiments. And so the security team that I'm on is in charge of making sure that we keep that system secure and running for all our users. Um, so then for the next slide, I can, I'll go over kind of how I got here. Um, so initially I went to community college where I had gotten um, a two year associate's degree in mathematics. Um, and then um, at the time I was just going uh, part time because I had been uh, working full time as a pharmacy technician. Um, but math had been like a really big interest for mine for um, quite a while. Um, and just like the course I didn't plan to get a degree in math, but I just took extra courses because it was fun. Um, and then um, I ended up transferring to after getting my degree to Texas State University. Um, where I earned a Bachelor of Science in uh, Computer Science, and that's also uh, 
the first time I ever really uh, took any um, computer science courses. Um, and uh, that's also, I started getting really into um, scientific computing and high performance computing. Uh, so during my undergraduate, I did um, a lot of uh, research internships. Um, so at places like the University of Colorado, um, Texas Advanced Computing Center, um, I did two internships at NERSC and then also one at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, and then also during my undergraduate, I worked um, in the compiler research lab at uh, Texas State University. Um, so uh, during all this time, my uh, research areas uh, were in um, things like how to make uh, software run faster and more efficient, um, how to conserve uh, energy uh, when you're running um, really computational intensive um, programs on a CPU or GPU, in what ways can you alter either the software or even the hardware, how much energy it's drawing in to help conserve the power uh, while keeping it low. Um, and a lot of the work I did focused on machine learning, which that's where the mathematics uh, comes in. Um, and then I started a master's program um, in, at the Technical University of Munich in uh, Germany with a focus on um, computer architecture and um, scientific computing. Um, but during that time, I ended up getting a job offer at NERSC. So I didn't complete that um, uh, program. Um, but so I started at NERSC in 2019 as a full-time software integration specialist. Um, which was just like uh, finding ways to help our users uh, better get their software onto our system, how to run it uh, more efficiently um, and various things like that. And then now um, this year I started as a cybersecurity engineer, which as you know, is like nothing in my path like has like much to do with uh, cybersecurity. Um, but so uh, the way I got into this was just um, as a side interest, I was really interested. I've always been really interested in how um, the computers work, how um, software works, how it interacts with the system. Um, so then, and that's part of why I like, like the um, compilers and things like that. So I spent a lot of my free time doing what's called a capture the flag um, competitions. And that's like a, um, kind of like a hacking type competition where you um, they're given challenges on a system and seeing if you can um, then like find a way to uh, find vulnerability and then you get a flag. Um, and then I also just really like finding like getting software to work in a way that it shouldn't be working. Um, so then while I was uh, working as the software integration specialist, I ended up um, finding a um, security vulnerability in one of our uh, systems. And then that's how I ended up being um, invited to apply an interview for the um, cybersecurity um, engineer job um, that I uh, got. Um, but so then, so for the next slide, I'll go ahead and tell you a bit about what that looks like at NERSC. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a um, one of the world's fastest computers uh, with 8,000 users running on it, um, which up at the top there, you can see that's our um, system currently, uh, Cori. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is focused on intrusion detection and uh, system monitoring. Um, so at NERSC, uh, we actually monitor all user activity on our systems. We use a variety of tools for this. Um, so I'm not, like we actually record everything that someone does and uh, monitor for any suspicious activity. If anything is uh, detected, then I um, would go in and investigate it, see if it is in fact um, malicious activity or not, um, and taking action to prevent any further harm. The other thing that I do a lot is uh, what um, are called security reviews. So I work directly with uh, software development teams at NERSC um, who are making software for a supercomputer. And I help them ensure that they don't have any security vulnerabilities in their software before it's um, introduced onto our system um, and give them recommendations on how they can make their software more secure. Um, we run tests against the software to make sure that it um, doesn't have any vulnerabilities, try to break it, um, things like that. Um, and then lastly, a lot of it too is uh, writing uh, security policy and documentation and then communicating with our users and with um, staff about the um, security best practices. Um, but I think that probably sums up pretty well what I do. 
Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Sam. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and we'll have to ask about your hackathons later. Um, we'll go to our next speaker, Talia Parker, who's joining us from Georgia um, and is an expert at uh, Georgia Tech Research Institute. So thank you for joining us, Talia. Thank you for having me, Faith. Um, hi, everyone. Like Faith mentioned, my name is Talia Parker, uh, cybersecurity and privacy architect. Uh, with Georgia Technology Research Institute, which is actually um, a component or research institute from Georgia Technology University. So we're, we're kind of separate from the university. Uh, we currently make up of about eight labs within the institute, and I work within the information uh, communication uh, lab laboratory. Uh, we work primarily on a lot of federal um, contracts, sometimes in the private uh, sector as well, uh, but mostly federal. Next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit about uh, my trajectory. Um, <clears throat> so in, uh, in about 2014, I had a peer uh, who mentioned to me that um, uh, data privacy was, uh, had not fully really uh, developed to where it was um, currently and thought it may be interesting to look into transitioning into that career. Um, I quit my job and ended up taking a four month internship uh, in data privacy where I learned about uh, different laws like HIPAA, uh, security and privacy laws, uh, EU safe harbor at the time, which was uh, a European uh, law, you know, um, from a privacy perspective, and um, and then uh, I, after four months of working in with a, that small consulting firm, I was able to land a, a huge opportunity to work for Deloitte. Uh, so within Deloitte, data privacy fell under their cybersecurity uh, umbrella, and they offered a number of services from identity and access management. Um, you know, strategy, uh, you know, the resilience of uh, security. And I had an opportunity to work with a number of clients. I worked in primarily state government uh, where I worked on regulations such as NIST, security and privacy um, controls. Uh, so doing controls assessment, gap analysis, writing system security plans, which is basically um, an outline of how the systems that uh, we're implementing or their current legacy systems, how they measure, um, you know, in terms of compliance and security from, from a NIST uh, standpoint. I also had the opportunity to uh, work in CISO labs where um, we brought in our top CISO clients and literally just assessed the entire security program, identified gaps, and I created strategic roadmaps and how um, they should fill that. So my, my time with Deloitte was about four years. And previous to that, I had finished my bachelor's um, in, in business at Florida a and University in Tallahassee, Florida. And, um, and so I decided to go ahead and uh, pursue a master's in, in international business. Um, I was traveling quite a bit in China and uh, Australia and doing all those internships abroad and uh, decided to, to get my um, MIBA. Uh, before I left Deloitte, I also decided to pursue another master's at Brown in cybersecurity. Um, and that was really the defining moment for me. That's when I was sure that I absolutely wanted to be in the space and where I wanted to narrow my focus. So I had an opportunity to work for Nike. Um, I, Nike owns Converse, which is based in Boston. So I was traveling quite a bit between Portland and Boston. And the, the, the job was to build out a privacy program uh, in which required me to work uh, with uh, our global counterparts in China, um, you know, uh, a lot of you are our European uh, counterparts, uh, driving a lot of GDPR uh, type related work, and really operationalizing a privacy program that was uh, kind of non existent. And uh, after working with Nike, um, is now I'm here at Georgia Tech and I'll talk more about the work that I, I do um, there uh, 
Okay, right here. Yeah, perfect. Um, so right now with Georgia Tech, I um, as I am driving uh, two tracks. One is the implementation of ServiceNow. ServiceNow is a uh, a tool uh, that is used to um, track and manage um, incidents and uh, compliance. It really just helps to create transparency throughout um, an enterprise. And so I'm driving uh, the ServiceNow implementation and, and what my work typically looks like is a lot of collaboration and um, working in teams, um, having a lot of workshop and uh, creating a structure and strategy for how uh, we can tackle all of our compliance um, requirements needs. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Talia. We'll have to talk about the, you know, business versus uh, academia and the needs between federal and, and business uh, privacy issues. Um, our next speaker and our final um, panelist for today is uh, staff scientist Sean Kaiser, who's here at Berkeley Lab, who will be giving us a little bit of background about his career, as well as an overview of the work he does here and as a professor at UC uh, Davis. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to speak with you all today. As uh, my colleague has mentioned, I'm a, a staff computer scientist at the Berkeley Lab. I am also adjunct faculty at UC Davis in the Department of Computer Science and at UC Davis School of Medicine in the Division of Health Informatics. Um, I'd like to share with you a little bit about how I got here uh, and a little bit about what I'm doing here now that I'm here. Uh, I'd actually like to start before this, um, this slide. I wish I had thought about it more at the time, but um, uh, my, my first interaction with computers started, I'm pretty sure, when I was in first grade. Um, and the school that I attended was fortunate enough to have what are now extremely ancient computer systems. I had to do a little bit of research to figure out what they were, remind myself, but uh, there was a Commodore PET. Um, and I, I don't have a picture of it to show you, but you might look it up at some point uh, to, to see a little bit about what that looked like. And um, the, uh, there was also an Apple II Plus. Um, I believe. And at the time, um, what we were doing with those was um, uh, using a programming language called Logo, which is designed to teach a turtle how to move around a screen. So if, if any of you have done Lego robotics classes, think about the, the ancient predecessor of that. Uh, we were also programming in something called AppleSoft Basic uh, as well, which was an uh, early predecessor to some of the, the modern programming languages we use it well as, as well. And I got intrigued by, by the, uh, the ability to do that. Um, as we went through um, uh, high school and into college, I actually didn't start as a computer science major. Uh, like my colleague Serge uh, mentioned, uh, he, uh, he kind of didn't take his first programming class till later. I, I started in I, uh, aerospace engineering. Um, I, I dabbled in biomedical engineering. For a while, I was a pre-med. Uh, eventually, I figured I kept trying to tie everything to computers, so we might as well just sort of stick with that. And, and, and I did end up doing my, my bachelor's degree in computer science. Eventually, um, there was a, a supercomputer on our campus. It was the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and I got an internship there. Um, it was a Cray, and that was very exciting uh, to, to be able to be affiliated with something that was doing work that, that was that cool. Um, that internship led me to my master's degree, which focused in high performance computing. Um, I then started a, uh, a startup um, with um, the, uh, the director of the Su San Diego Supercomputer Center was on my board, although we started in March of 2000, uh, which was exactly when the market crashed from the dot com bust. And so it was a complete failure. Um, I went back to do my PhD uh, with the, uh, the director of the supercomputer center again, who was my advisor. Um, I said, um, I want to go back to grad school. He said, I'm doing security. And I said, okay, great, let's do that. Um, it turned out that someone um, uh, who had at one point uh, broken into the San Diego supercomputer center um, and sort of set off a flurry of, of interest in, in cybercrime and everything else as well. Um, uh, he, so the, the computer who's of the person he broke into uh, was kind of still around. His name was Sutomu Shimamura, and he and a handful of other people that were involved in, in, in investigating that incident served as inspirations and kind of unofficial mentors. And so it kind of went on from there and, and just uh, it was this organic thing. It was not intentional from the beginning. 
I will say, like my uh, my, my friend uh, Serge, though, he, uh, you know, I, I don't really see myself as a programmer either, despite the fact that I started doing that as when I was six years old. I can do it, but it's kind of not my, my aspiration. And so, uh, but I did get into research. I did get excited about learning and discovering new things. And so here I am uh, in, in this path. Um, but one thing I will say is, you know, um, the, the things we plan, set out to do aren't necessarily where we've ended up. And, and you can see this meandering path of arrows uh, as I've gotten here. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I'm working on quite uh, right now is on uh, enabling scientific computation on sensitive data. Um, I've been doing this in a number of domains, but one of the domains I'm, I'm particularly excited about doing this in is healthcare. And one of the reasons for this is because of the pandemic we're all in right now. Uh, I've observed that in so many domains, we just aren't sharing data uh, because we're so worried about um, what's going to happen to it if it gets exposed. And, and for good reason. There, there's a lot of cyber crime, cyber war. There's Every day we see some sort of new leakage of data. And so a lot of my work has involved both software and hardware to do trusted execution. So that way we, we can uh, reduce the amount of risk for a data center hosting information. I'm also working in a field called differential privacy, which tries to avoid disclosure of information back to a data analyst. So the combination of these things, which we're working with different scientists in healthcare domains and transportation domains and a number, number of other scientific fields to, uh, to try and develop means to, to do this in a secure and private way. And I'll say that's really what security and privacy uh, and computing is about at the Berkeley Lab. It's enabling science. It's not science. It's not just writing papers and doing computer security things for their own right. It's, it's making other science work better. Next slide, please. Actually, that's, uh, sorry, we're at the end of our uh, introductions, but we do have time for questions. Sorry about that, John. Is there one more thing you want to share with the group before we get into everybody coming back on for uh, uh, questions and answers? Yeah, the, the one more thing that I was just going to mention is that we're also working on the security of critical infrastructure. I think I had a slide in here on the power grid. And so one of, one of the things we're doing quite a lot is looking at the way computers interface with other elements in our environment. So the power grid is a big one that pertains to the Department of Energy, but we also are looking at manufacturing um, autom automated vehicles and, and, and those sorts of things as well. This is the time that we open up to do questions and answers. But before that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Edith Lai, who is also helping to produce this uh, series of talks that we've had over the next couple of weeks. And so Edith, if you go ahead and introduce yourself, she'll also be watching the chat box uh, to get questions from the audience. Yeah, hi everyone. So I work with Faith on the K through 12 STEM education and outreach team, uh, specifically on digital media. So like the flyer, some of you saw earlier and also our social media. And yeah, as Faith mentioned, I'll also be watching the chat box. So if you all wanna start asking your questions on base, based on what the panelists have introduced, or if you have any other questions about cybersecurity and privacy, um, go ahead and start populating the chat. First question that is, um, how often do breaches occur um, on supercomputers. And I think that might go to Tiffany, who's working at NERSC um, from our audience. Yeah, so luckily, not very often. Um, most of uh, the security uh, systems we have in place catch it um, any breach before it actually happens. A uh, big part of what we do is a multi-factor authentication. Um, so a user has to have both their uh, password as well as um, a code from um, like a, their phone uh, sent to them in order to log on. There are other um, computer system, um, like large supercomputers who have had uh, breaches um, fairly recently in this past year, actually. Um, I know of that was just because of the authentication uh, methods they uh, used where they enabled um, what's called SSH keys, um, which then just uh, has a private key placed on your computer. And then like the um, system that you use has another, um, the, like the corresponding key. So then all you have to do to log in is have access to that key and the username. And so those um, can get stolen. Uh, so there had been some high, um, supercomputers this year that had seen that. Um, and that was um, um, a lot of what we've seen uh, recently on these type of attacks is where people are um, breaching them in order to try use them for things like um, Bitcoin mining 
Um, so not so much as destroying data. And Sean, you want to follow up? I, I, I think Tiffany mentioned one of the things that I was going to point out with, but you know, it's, it's very common for us to think about computer security and uh, have it uh, focus mostly on the issue of confidentiality or stealing data. Uh, but really, there's other things we care about in, in computer security as well. And Tiffany point out, pointed out one, there have been incidents of people commandeering uh, supercomputers to mine bitcoins. Uh, one of them was on an NSF supercomputer a few years ago. And just a year or two ago, um, some uh, Russian scientists at a nuclear computing facility um, used their own supercomputer to start mining bitcoins for a brief period of time. The other one, which Tiffany also mentioned, uh, uh, which I just wanted to reiterate, was uh, you know tampering with data or destroying data can can be equally, if not more, problematic in certain circumstances than than stealing data. Okay, thank you. And to go to Serge, um, how can we protect ourselves from cyber harm? I know you're doing a lot of human interface uh, with computers. So how can we protect ourselves from cyber harm? Um, there are a couple things. So one is most of the time when there's a data breach, it, it might seem like, oh, it's an inconsequential account. Like, you know, some online service that you never use, you might not wor be worried about the data. But the reason why hackers are interested in that is that they know there's a good chance that you have the same password on a different site that might have more important data, such as maybe your Facebook account or even a, a bank account. Um, and so that's why you know it's important that there, there are technologies that prevent this, such as password managers. Um, the whole point of a password manager is it allows you to create a unique password for lots of different sites and not have to remember them. Um, but we know from experiments that people generally don't use them um, for many different reasons. And also people often use them incorrectly, such as using them to store the same password for every website, you know, to make it easier to type in, but not so that they can actually have a, a strong, unique password on, on every site. Um, and so there's you know, a lot of work to be done there. You might use those things. Uh, maybe you could try convincing, you know, explaining to your parents uh, and family and friends why that's important. Um, you know, adopting these you know, new technologies to help combat different you know, online risks takes a lot. Um, and there's actually a lot of research on public health um, that, that's, that's similar on this. So for instance, you know, uh, stop smoking campaigns have existed for 30, 40 years, but it's only really been effective in the last you know, decade or, or so and, and not completely. Um, and so, you know, convincing the people to change their behavior is difficult. Um, some of that relies on getting the messaging just right, uh, similar to, say, a, a political campaign. Um, and some of it is also just making the technology easy to use. A lot of the time, things don't get used because they're difficult to use. And so people will then rightly reject them. Um, so understanding um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you could help to try and, you know, convince others to engage in better behaviors um, and explaining why they're important. Um, that's another reason why people, you know, don't engage in, in some of these behaviors is because they just don't think it's worthwhile. Um, so, you know, using, uh, uh, getting people to use password management managers would help a lot. Um, Two-factor authentication, so using your phone as a, a separate authentication device. That way, if someone does steal your password, um, they can't get into your account because they would also need to steal your phone. Um, you know, the, those are um, those are good measures that people can take that are relatively easy. The other is just updating your software. By and large, um, most of the time when systems get hacked, it's it's random. It's not you know a targeted attack, but it's you know a hacker is looking for some system that's exploitable. Um, so if you keep your software up to date, and that's mostly what software updates are, are fixes for bugs that could otherwise allow a hacker to get into your computer. By keeping your software up to date, you make it a lot harder for you know a random uh, hacker to to get access to your system. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. So I kind of want to ask a connected question to Talia. So you mentioned that you worked in the private sector as well as an academic institution. So in your time at Deloitte and Nike, um, what are some things you focused on when you worked for those businesses? 
Um, so during my time at Deloitte, so consulting is a, a little bit of a different beast because we have different clients, different clients have different needs. Um, so uh, one of the things that we worked on is a lot, driving a lot of privacy uh, risk assessments and security risk assessments for our clients. And typically the approach for that is um, identifying who the key stakeholders are um, in the business and um, who are certain system owners and really getting as much information from them as possible um, about these systems. Um, and in some cases, we were migrating from legacy systems, especially when you think about government clients. A lot of them have outdated systems. <laughs> um, and, and even now, you know, we have clients that are considering migrating to the cloud. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's one other aspect of my work is um, learning the cloud uh, infrastructure and really understanding the differences in uh, security responsibilities between um, us uh, or, you know, an AWS. Um, we're using AWS cloud. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a, just one aspect of the work that we're doing. Um, with Nike, uh, that was... One of, the, one of the experiences that I had there is uh, as the privacy person for Converse, we outsource a lot of the things that we were, were doing, all of the services. So there's a lot of third party risks um, and you know trying to get GDPR compliance. Uh, so driving a lot of those risk assessments and a huge part actually of my role is relationship building uh, because I need insight and transparency into what the other teams are doing. And uh, a lot of times people see security and privacy folks as um, uh, you're kind of like the police <laughs> um, for the, the things they're trying to do. They have all these innovative ideas and um, you know, uh, launches that they're trying to do. And sometimes if things get to us at the last minute, you know, we can put a stop on it and it, it kind of impedes on their productivity and hitting their goals. So what I, I try to do is be intentional with relationship building, really having insight into what it is that they're doing and really creating, uh, one of the things I did was create a, a privacy intake uh, form for things that they should consider as they are coming up with you know, ideas and things that they wanna do uh, for the business. Um, and then I kind of built my own privacy champions. You know, So it got to the point where it made my job so much easier, especially as a team of one who, and, and this is a lot large business, right? There's so, you have so many business um, needs and teams that are doing all these different things. And uh, one of the easiest way to get better insight is relationship building and um, building your own privacy champions throughout the business. Uh, and then really leaning on our global counterparts to see what they are doing, what solutions have are they coming up with. Um, one of the things were, you know, tags and cookie tracking. Um, that was a, a big pro project for, for me is creating a process for that because we're sharing code with, um, you know, a, a number of uh, partners and making sure we're only sending them the data that we've agreed to send them and that there's nothing sensitive that we are, you know, allowing them to, to, uh, to do and also monitoring our contracts for how long, what time period have we agreed to send them, you know, certain data and, and what level of transparency are we providing to our consumers, right? So there's, there's one thing about saying, well, this is our policy notice, you know, this is how we collect your data. This is what we're doing with it. But then being able to take that and go back to the security and engineering teams and say, well, how can you configure it on the back end so that when consumers come to our website, they have the option to select and, you know, determine what they want us to collect and what they want us to share. So uh, it's really a collaborative uh, approach and a lot of relationship building in order for me to understand and know what's going on throughout the business. Great. Thank you, Talia. Um, speaking and getting into being collaborative, we can also talk about being creative. Um, cybersecurity, engineering, privacy um, typically leans itself into being a, you know, a surgeon, and Sean has pointed out um, this uh, not very creative, very programming in a basement, hoodie on, does not talk to anyone kind of image that we've talked about, you know, when you Google, what does it mean to be someone in cybersecurity? So where are there opportunities to be creative and collaborative 
within this work and, you know, how is this, you both have, uh, and many people have said that you're not so much programming anymore, but building these relationships and teams. How do you see that in your work? And, and we'll start back with Sean and then go to Tiffany, Serge, and Talia, if you can um, speak to being creative and collaborative within your um, work. Um, so uh, create, uh, creativity uh, uh, and collaborativity, collaborativeness um, are, are central to the work that I, I'm trying to do. Um, there is no problem that I've done, worked on recently that has been worth solving that could be done by a single person or, or frankly, even by the people that I work with, just, just the people I work with at the lab. Just about everything I do involves collaborations with um, uh, faculty in universities, um, connections with um, uh, commercial um, companies that uh, are help, sort of helping ground the, the work that we're doing in reality. Um, and, and very often in both of these situations as well, people who come from other domains. So I work in power grid security, which means that I actually need to work with power engineers. Uh, when I work with uh, in, in security for medical data, I actually need to work with doctors and health researchers. Um, and and it's, it's sort of the, uh, the, the the, the interesting part is, is, in fact, getting to learn all of these new domains. Security is, is rarely just securing security in the abstract. It's security of something. And so getting to learn and work with the people who, who um, are, are, are responsible for or who care about securing these other domains is a really exciting part of what, what I do. Tiffany? Most of... Oh, should I go? Um. Yeah, so definitely, um, like I had mentioned earlier, I do like a lot of the security um, reviews, which that's a collaboration with those software developers. It's not just me looking at their code and saying, hey, like, this is wrong, or running tests. It's an ongoing conversation. We actually meet and have multiple meetings to discuss it. And then uh, creativity wise, like um, I had mentioned for that, part of it is too, is making sure there's not vulnerabilities. So you have to be able to think creatively of different ways and different things that could possibly be wrong in that system that normally you might have not thought of. Um, so there's a lot of creativity in that and coming up with different um, tests that you can do against it, um, different ways you can try to um, hack it. And then uh, there's also just like coming up with a new, um, like what new net technology will introduce into um, our cybersecurity defenses. So one of the great things about working at NERSC is we're very adoptive of new technology, um, so, uh, like somewhere like Twitter or um, somewhere like that, um, tends to go more for stuff like that they is well known while we um, try out a bunch of different things at the same time, evaluate different um, new products, um, and new software that's written in house. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of um, creativity and collaboration with all of that as well. Okay, thanks, and Serge, sorry. Um, no, I mean, most of the work that I do is very interdisciplinary. So in terms of, you know, looking at uh, people's behavior, I, I do a lot of work with psychologists, um, as I said, and, you know, more recently looking at, um, you know, what apps are doing and services are doing with personal data. Um, a, a lot of that has been done through the lens of, you know, looking at who's violating various privacy laws. And so for that, you know, that, that, that has relied on collaborations with lawyers to, to understand, you know, with what the laws are and what we're, you know, in terms of what we're finding, um, how that fits in with, with laws. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all very interdisciplinary. Thank you. And so for a student who wants to get into this kind of work, um, what would you recommend? And I'll go back to Serge to you. Um, what would you recommend to a student um, to start thinking about if they want to get into cybersecurity and this type of work? Um, what are some classes or just some um, different types of tools or, or computational thinking? You know, what should they start thinking about if they want to get into this type of research or work um, in the private sector? Uh, work hard and stay in school. Uh, no, um, uh, seriously, the, I don't know, um, security, getting into security, uh, I mean, there's a lot to read online. Um, there are bug bounty contests, um, you, you know, that you could probably participate in. A lot of um, services now are outsourcing their, 
you know, vulnerability discovery um, to contests where, you know, they open up systems to uh, people to try and find security vulnerabilities and there are cash prizes. Um, there are people who do this as a full-time job. Um, so, you know, as a high school student, that's totally something that you probably could do. Um, and there are also various cybersecurity boot camps online. I, I haven't done any of those directly. I'm sure others can probably speak more about those. Um, but in terms of, you know, past high school, I mean, the thing, the thing that I would I would suggest if you want a research career in, in cybersecurity, um, when you're in college and you you know and, and you're still interested in this, get involved with research. Um, uh, you know, find a professor who's doing research um, at your university in cybersecurity and just ask if you can participate in research. Um, you know, we love that sort of thing. It gets new students involved and it's, you know, it's help on existing research projects. Um, and that's probably the primary thing that gets looked at when you apply to grad school. Um, more than grades or test scores, um, it's your experience doing research. And so if you decide that you want, you know, to, to get a, a research degree, then uh, being involved in research as a, you know, undergraduate or even in high school um, puts you well beyond many of the other applicants. Edith, did you want to do a follow up with Talia? Yeah, so Talia, you do some mentorship with um your nonprofit group, would you like to talk a little bit about like how you teach young, young students who are interested in cybersecurity? Yes, uh, absolutely. So one of the things that, um, one of the analogies I always give about the world of cybersecurity is healthcare, right? When you think about healthcare, not everyone is a surgeon. You have your nurses, your doctors, you have, you know, pharmaceuticals, you have all these different elements that make up healthcare. And cybersecurity is the same way. It's like there's so you, you can't really say cybersecurity and it means this one thing. Everyone plays a role. And so with with uh, that group, and you know, specifically due to lack of diversity as an African American woman, um, a lot of it is lack of awareness. You know, you don't really you hear cybersecurity, but you don't really know what it means. So I really take pride in sharing as much as I can about what it is that I do and also helping to guide the research, right? Um, also helping them to identify their current skills. You know, what is it that you're currently doing on the job that may be transferable? Because honestly, the biggest aspect of my work is being able to communicate effectively. <laughs> um, so it's a lot of, you know, taking in difficult technical concepts, right? and being able to translate that either up or down. Usually I'm in the middle, you know, whether I'm either talking, talking to executives, they don't really care about, you know, all of the details. So just really being able to craft that message and then being able to take their concerns and their needs and kind of double that down to the ones who are doing the implementation. So I'm always managing up and managing down. So effective communication, you know, written communication, um, a lot of documentation uh, is what you'll you'll find, especially in my role of cybersecurity. Uh, so I, I'm really always trying to pull different people to share their experiences. And you always find that common denominator um, is not always coding. Although I will say I'm at a point in my career where I'm trying to learn how to code, <laughs> um, you know, but it's, it's, I've made it over the past eight years, not coding. Um, so I, I really want to change that narrative that, you know, you're, you're in, in, uh, in the basement, <laughs> in a dark basement uh, coding. <laughs> that's, that's one aspect of it. But um, a lot of it is really collaboration and effective communication. Thanks. And, and Tiffany, you talked about the hackathons that you were a part of that helped you get into the cybersecurity space and catch a bug at NERSC. So can you tell us a little bit more about those opportunities for, you know, those who are interested in cybersecurity to get into those types of competitions and how that could play a, a factor in their career? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a big part of that, to, um, being able to do these, uh, why it's good if you're interested in cybersecurity is because then it enables you to learn like how hackers think, what type of tools they use, um, and easier for you to detect like different type of vulnerabilities and know what to expect. 
Um, there's a lot of online um, ones are held. Um, there's some that are competition wise where there's um, cash prizes. And there's others that are just open all year that you use just to practice. Um, so one that I had also displayed on my uh, um, on my um, slides is called uh, Pico uh, Capture the Flag. And that one's um, available uh, year round. And that one's really good for beginners. Um, and it was one of the first ones that I uh, started um, with. And it just gives you like, um, it gives you a lot of hints if you get stuck or anything. Um, and it has basic skills that you need to know um, and then builds up on um, it. And so that one's, um, I think it's the most recent one they have online is, uh, it's like tw uh, 2019 uh, pico uh, ctf.com. Um, and then also, um, which um, Sarah had mentioned this is there's the bug bounty programs. The uh, most known one, the base one is uh, Hacker One, And with that one, they also have um, a capture the flag um, for beginners with a, um, and it's a Hacker 101 um, capture the flag. And that one also uh, focuses mostly on uh, web application vulnerabilities and helps you, uh, it's meant to help you gain skills in order to participate in actual bug bounty programs. Uh, which if you go on to like um, Hacker One, um, you can join and there's like all these different companies that post and say these systems, you're allowed to go try to hack them and see what it is. So that's also a great way to get kind of um, started with it. But definitely the beginner ones, um, two I mentioned are good because you can actually find walkthroughs that if you get stuck, they'll tell you what steps to take in order to proceed. Awesome, and Sean, your um, faculty at UC Davis as well and in instructing students, any particular things you tell them as they're starting off on their careers or to think about, especially if they're interested in security and privacy? Uh, so I, I will confess, I don't work, typically work with our, our youngest students, the undergraduates, um, but um, in our health informatics graduate program, I, I do get a lot of people who are coming to the field who are not necessarily coming in with a background in in computing and 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 programming, and I, I think um, it, it's important to reinforce the point that a lot of folks have made today, which is that um, uh, computer security and privacy means a lot of different things. And if you like programming, if you like competitions, if you like bug bounties, and you want to do that, there's there's plenty of room for that for you. If if you're not into some of those things, there's plenty of room in other places as well. There's uh, a lot of the work that Serge has talked about in terms of human factors, which also has ties into um, sociology and psychology of why do people do things in certain ways. There's, uh, there's, there's policy and law, there's uh, economics in terms of what are the, the cost benefit analyses to malicious actors as well as, well as defenders to do certain things. There's sort of a whole, there's so many spec different ways that you can come at this. And of course, and, and again, this reinforces Serge, Serge's point, there, there's the people who are the end users? There's uh, the, the ones that actually have to, um, to use the computer systems that you're applying all this, these security techniques and, and tools to. And so you need to engage with them and actually figure out, are, are they gonna follow the rules? And, and if they do, what's that actually gonna do to the, to, for, for them, their ability to get their job done? Awesome, and I think that is great for a wrap up for thinking about what can students do um, we have three minutes left, so I want to give everybody 30 seconds to kind of 30 second advice for yourself at about 18, 19 years old, starting out on your career. What advice would you give yourself? Again, 18, 19, I'll give you a second to think about it. And uh, Tiffany, I'll start with you. 30 second advice, if you could, you know, time travel, what would you tell yourself? Um, I guess just like to, um make sure and stay involved with um, school activities um, and uh, what you're interested and passionate about and to stay uh, creative and curious. So Talia? Yeah, oh, that's a tricky one. Um, well, I always say if I knew everything I knew now then, I probably would have entered technology a lot sooner. You know, I got a bachelor's in business, a master's in international business, and 
while those were all great, um, I really wish I didn't think computers were so boring. <laughs> and then I was just so afraid of it. Um, I was like, I do not want to be just isolated. I'm a people person. Um, but I would have, you know, encouraged myself to um, step out and be a little bit more bold and brave with not tackling challenging, you know, or what appears to be super challenging um, tough uh, subjects, because now here I am a couple of years later doing pretty okay <laughs> um, in the world of cybersecurity. So uh, I would have definitely encouraged myself to, to uh, you know, pursue that sooner. Awesome. Thank you, Serge. Mostly just that, you know, computing is a lot more than just programming, and there are a lot of societal implications uh, of computing um, that I think that a lot of, you know, students aren't really exposed to and don't really think about, um, you know, everything from, you know, current talk about privacy uh, to, you know, intellect, you know, issues of intellectual property, um, and you know accountability, fairness uh, in terms of algorithmic decision making, and all of these you know societal implications require broad understandings, not just knowing how to you know write a program. Um, and that's why I think you know these are important issues to look at, and they require you know approaching them from many different directions. And finally, Sean, your thirty-second advice to yourself at eighteen, nineteen. Take the time to learn. Uh, you, 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 it, it's, hard, it's hard to learn after you've left school. So take the time to learn. Appreciate the, that time that you're given. Uh, don't resent your professors who are trying to teach you things. There's a reason that they're trying to teach you these things. And I, I would encourage you to embrace them. Second, um, don't be afraid of trying new things. Uh, the computer security and privacy, and frankly, all disciplines um, are rarely about setting a goal and, and getting to there in a straight line. Explore, take, try, try some things that you don't think you're good at, some things that you don't think you're like, that, that you like, you may be wrong. And, and school and, and college is the time to learn some of those things. So learn anything. Awesome, thank you. Those are good words to end on. And I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to be on our panel. So thank you panelists. Um, we are recording this and gonna put it up and, and we'll post and send out to everybody who had to miss today. Um, but I thank you for giving your advice and sharing a little bit more of what it really means to be a cybersecurity and privacy expert. So thank you. Thank you, Faith.